just a small effort to do that, to try to understand what are the different issues around urban inequality that we all face, how, how do we understand them, how do we address those issues. And we're very, very fortunate to have here with us the Sri Lanka team. Um, and I just wanted to quickly introduce them and then I'll walk through the plan for today's event. So first we have with us, I in order, we have Professor Jonathan Spencer, um, who is the principal investigator on the project. He is Professor Emeritus of South Asian Language, Culture and Society at the University of Edinburgh. He's been working uh, in Sri Lanka since the early 1980s, concentrating at first on rural change and local politics, but writing more recently on ethnic conflict, political violence, and political non-violence. His current research looks at the history of dissent in Sri Lanka and at the politics of access to the great for poor communities and cities in Sri Lanka, India, and Pakistan. He is a fellow of the British Academy, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and the Academy of Social Sciences. Um, next, I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to Amara, but after Amara, we have uh, Rai Valhagar, who is a feminist researcher and activist. Her work spans various domains, including academia, community-based initiatives, and polit political activism. Rai's area of academic interest includes gender, urban poor, and labor rights. She is actively involved in community-based work and has led multi-stakeholder community initiatives, fostering collaboration among diverse groups to address social issues. And this isn't listed in Rai's bio, but Rai is also the mayoral candidate for Colombo. So we're very wow. happy to have her here. Um, <clears throat> after Rai, we have uh, Iromi Pereira. Um, Iromi is a Colombo based researcher and activist and works on post war urban development and spatial justice in Sri Lanka. She is the founder and director of Colombo Urban Lab. Her research looks at the lived experience of communities affected by large scale infrastructure projects and development master plans, focusing on housing, livelihood, public space, and social protection. And last but not least, we have Dilipa Vithanana. I've uh, been asking Dilipa how to pronounce his last name all morning. Uh, Dilipa serves as senior lecturer at the Department of Mathematics and the Philosophy of Engineering, and as a director of the Center for Environmental Studies and Sustainable Development at the Open University uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, he obtained his PhD from the Netherlands and he's looked at the relationship between Sri Lanka engineering and civil nationalism. He currently also serves as a director of a non-profit organization established in 2011 to promote sustainable and green solutions. His research interests focus on urban poverty in politics, electricity and water reforms, engineering and nationalism, history and technical education, energy and environmental policy practice, and multilateral and bilateral trade agreements. So thank you all once again for being here in Lahore. And I'll just quickly walk through uh, how we've organized today's event. So first, we're going to share a uh, screen a short film called Being Here that's been directed by Shani Jayavarpana. And it's based on some of the work that our colleagues, uh, Do Dr. Asha Vesikra, who couldn't be with us here today, but also Iromi and Rai have been work doing Kulam over the past three years. And I'm going to ask Rai to say a few words before we screen the film. We then share some initial findings from the work that we've been doing in Lahore. Um, and it's been focused on our four village settlements on the outskirts of the city. Well, not really outskirts anymore, but I'll talk more about that. And then we have a short discussion for about half an hour that will be moderated by Dr. Marek Sood, who is an associate professor in social anthropology at UCL. Um, and then we finally will ask Dr. Uh, professor Jonathan Spencer to share his closing remarks. So I'm just going to ask Rai to say a few words. Um, and then we'll start again. But thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much, firstly, to Fiza and Ubair and the team, the Lava team, for hosting us. It's such an honor for us to be here and for the Lita and I. It's the first time we are coming here. Europe has been here before, but we're very excited to be here. And we're also very excited to show our film, which we did last year. It started being here. Um, and we're basically looking at Colombo City and the lives of women who have to navigate living in a world-class city. Um, so it looks at working-class women and the lives of poor women um, from the city. And this is based on, the film is based on research work that we have done for, for three years um, with the women in the city. Um, and it was really important to us and I think it was a bit of a a light bulb, light bulb moment the previous year when we had met in Edinburgh to talk about what each of our teams, Mumbai, Lahore and Colombo were doing and the, the India, India team, we had one of our colleagues, uh, Rohan Shiv Kumar, he shared a film that he had done which is entirely different, it's a kind of an autobiographical architectural film but it's beautiful and very poetic and we, found, we decided 
um, then and there, I think, just before we, we had even come back to Colombo to recap everything, we were like, this is such an exciting idea, it's so beautiful, and maybe we want to find a way to use uh, a non-traditional way, which is basically we wanted to move out of our um, academic space, in that sense, just not being confined to papers, but find a different way in which we wanted to tell the stories of these women to people that was uh, more accessible to a larger group, a large audience. So the film, in that sense, we released it in, it's a documentary film, it's 32 minutes, and we showcased it in, uh, in August, and then we've had several screenings afterwards. Uh, just to let you know, also, Shana Jayavardhana is an incredible, I mean, she's a really uh, empathetic and uh, wonderful filmmaker to work with, and we really wanted to work with someone who also understood our ethics, which was, we didn't want to romanticize poverty, we didn't want to, um, we didn't want the films of these women, the film that was showcasing these women to only talk about poverty, to only talk about the hardships, but also talk about joy and laughter and all these other beautiful things that is very much a part and parcel of their lives. So this is our small attempt to um, talk about that along with the other more um, kind of solid academic work that goes into it. So this is our film and thank you once again for giving us an opportunity to to uh, show it, and of course, when we're done, I'm sure we'll have time for questions if we do have any. Thanks. Thanks a lot. From uh, Colombo, we now come back to the world. Um, we'll be sharing with you some of our initial findings from the work that we've been doing in four of Lahore's urban villages over the past two years. And I'll be presenting today alongside my colleagues and co-investigators on the project, Hala Bashir Malik, um, who is a Lahore-based architect and researcher and runs a design practice called Hyper Practice, and Dr. Mehta Vaid, who is an assistant professor of politics and sociology at LUMS. Um, our wider team, including there's Aiza, um, Ali and Mohan are also there. Um, so any, any questions are all available afterwards. So each time I've seen this Colombo film, I think a lot about Arif Hassan Saab's description of the word class city and how well it fits in with a lot of the changes that are discussed here. So I wanted to kind of just refresh our memories a little bit um, and just go through this really quickly. And he says, you know, the word class city should be one that has iconic architecture by which it should be recognized, such as the Lotus Tower in this case. It should be branded for a particular cultural, industrial, or other projects are happening. It should be an international event city. It should have high-rise apartments as opposed to upgraded settlements and neighborhoods. It should cater to tourism. It should build flyovers, underpasses, and expressways. We are you know, way ahead in that. Um, and it should build investment-friendly infrastructure. And I really felt, after having seen the Colombo film, but also having worked together for all these years, that Colombo kind of checks all these boxes. But when we've been talking amongst ourselves about like, what does the world class city look like in the case of Lahore, for instance, and we thought, then in Lahore, world class city is best conceptualized as a low density, private, suburban housing scheme. This is Beria Town over here. Um, it's a scheme that offers world class facilities such as wide roads, a gated and secure environment, commercial plaza, shopping centers, that's built primarily for high income groups and investors. But it has no real space for the poor except those who come and work in, this, in the settlement itself. And over the past two to three decades, we've seen Lahore expand rapidly. So this is going up to 2013. And much of this expansion has been in the form of such housing schemes as developers have converted as a cultural land in the peripheries of the city into residential use. But something that we've observed is that when developers acquire agricultural land, uh, they actually leave the homestead, so this, this area over here, for instance, as it is. I mean, this is not always the case, particularly in the DHA, they do acquire these the homesteads as well. But you can see over here, this is 2003, and there are a couple of homesteads here. And this is their agriculture land. And then this is 2011. And all of the agricultural land is gone, replaced by residential real estate. But the settlement still remains there. It's just been completely encircled and surrounded by the new housing scheme. And you know, the, the scheme, the, the, uh, these villages, the homestead is left in most cases not because the developer's concern for them, but it's also because the homestead land is also very expensive to profit from. And so it's left as is, and there's also politics associated with it, which Mayor will talk about, about a little bit more. But this phenomenon of urban villages isn't unique to Pakistan. There's a lot written about it in India and in China as well. 
But particularly in our case, especially when we talk about housing, we talk a lot about kachi abadis, we, you know, we talk about housing issues there. But these settlements serve as housing for a wide majority of working class groups in the city. And they also suffer from poor access to services and basic amenities. But we don't really talk about them in any policy agendas. But there is more work emerging now um, that seeks to both understand how the acquisition happens and how it also then transforms life inside these villages. And that's kind of the perspective with which we started our work. So these were our original research questions. It's a lot of text, so I'm not going to read them all out um, at once. But basically, the idea was we wanted to understand once these settlements are encircled by such schemes. How does that affect densities inside? How does that affect access to services? Um, you know, what, and then how does that connect to higher order changes that are happening in the city? And then finally, from a policy perspective, what are the lessons that we can learn? Once we started the research, we realized it was also equally important to understand how land was being acquired before the um, conversion itself and then how that ends up changing social relations inside the village itself. So today, Hala is going to talk about the first question, Omer is going to talk about the second and the third question. We're going to park the policy question, and we want to organize something separately for that. And I'm going to look at these last two questions on land acquisition, but particularly on the second one, just in the interest of time. So, you know, before I do that, I just wanted to quickly share um, how we got to the method or how do we select these four villages. I'm not going to go into too much detail because it was a very extensive process of kind of mapping out housing schemes, mapping out village settlements, um, and, and we can go into those details during the question and answer session. But just to say that after that, we selected four different villages in Lahore. The first one is Cheddar, which most of you may know is based right here in defense. Um, Cheddar's land was acquired roughly 40 years ago by the, by the then Lahore Improvement Cooperative Society. And the area around it has been was fully occupied. The second site is Hirpalki, which is now based in DHA Phase 9. The land for this has mostly been acquired, but there are still some pockets left. Infrastructure has been completely built out over here, but people haven't moved in here yet. Then we did some fieldwork in Sheikhport and Jandate. Sheikhport is now surrounded by Bayer Town, Jandate is surrounded by Lake City. Both Sheikhport and Jandate have been surrounded in the early 2000s. Uh, so they offer kind of some temporal variation between Jaran and Herbalke. But also we get a mix of developer types. So we have big private developers, but then we also have the DHA. So we've been carrying out fieldwork here for roughly two years or so now. Uh, we're, you know, we're still in the middle. We're hoping to do some more interviews. We've done 136 interviews in different villages, also 33 interviews with different um, secondary stakeholders, and rely on direct observation, photo documentation, mapping, and secondary data collection. So if I just come back to the original kind of question on land acquisition, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but I just wanted to kind of point out two things. One thing is that when you know, we talk a lot about the 1894 Land Acquisition Act, uh, but one thing that we've learned through this work is that developers have increasingly been relying on market-based mechanisms to acquire land, which means that they rely on intermediaries, middlemen, to acquire land for them, making payments in cash or in files. And this is done as a way to, one, initially reduce compensation costs because without thinking of the housing scheme failure is the main acquirer and also to minimize resistance, and, and it's termed as a more friendly way of acquiring land. But there are all kinds of coercive and non-coercive tactics used to acquire land. But the ultimate aim is that you want to buy land cheap and then sell it at a high price and maximize profits that way. The other thing that we see also is that village residents themselves have become quite aware of the value of their land, and they also aim to maximize the kind of compensation that they can get. So I'm going to move on to the second question, and this is a quote from a school teacher in Hirpalke, where he says, you know, earlier landowners didn't know what their land was being used for. Investors would just express an interest in agricultural land, people were convinced to sell. But now all landholders are smart, people have come to realize the value of their land. Although, of course, there may be some cases where the big investor knows more than others do. And, you know, we also find that the logic of the market is penetrating social relations in the village. So if you look over here, these are different quotes from people um, in, in, across the villages that we've been working in. And here everyone's talking about how life used to be very simple before. There was no greed of making money. There was food security. We would look out for each other. And, you know, we, we'd help each other out. 
And you know, I mean, these may be romanticized notions of what community life was like before, right? Because there were also inequalities that existed before developers came in. But there's a sense in every single village that we've been to that something has changed in the way that people relate to one another, something in terms of how they understand their obligations towards one another, ever since developers have come in to acquire their land. And there's some villages, particularly those with large parcels of land, or those with traditional authority in the villages since colonial periods, such as number of um, in, in these settlements, they've been able to make a lot of money, but there are all these stories that we hear about, you know, village residents driving land cruisers or driving fortuners, of Nisari Pese or Pirum Nepal, just like the Kyawar. And which coincides with something that we heard about the Chaudhary sentiment. So everyone says, you know, how do you Chaudhary banget? You know, um, everyone is written in Chaudhary these days, and, and, and you know, there's no central authority, no matter what we do, someone else will come and say it should have been done this way. And they say that Chaudhary wo batte hain, tak paise khatam nahi ho jate hai. Right, so but for these residents complained, and even those who were Chaudhary's apparently themselves, that this was preventing them from having a united front against the developers, in case they wanted to negotiate for better services, and it was also creating further divisions in the communities. So this kind of changing social relations and the way that historical intra-community inequalities continue to play out is something that's been studied in other contexts as well. I'm thinking of the work of Michael Levine as well um, in India. But what's not always apparent is that these hierarchies are also strategically exploited by developers. And so this was very frankly shared by a real estate developer I spoke to for my own doctoral work. Um, and I thought it was really important to mention here because he said, it's really challenging to acquire land in Pakistan because as soon as residents find out a housing scheme is coming, they start to blackmail you and they, they decide not to sell, etc. So you have to be very creative in how you get them to sell. So he said, our people, the land acquisition team on the ground, our connectors, actually we have to break up families. The way our social structure works is, if I have to sell something, I'll ask my mamu and chacha. So you make the mamu and chacha the property leader. You say, I'll give you 2% commission if you convince them to sell the land. And this, he thought, was a very successful strategy. And he shared that he, you know, they also go to village notables, such as the novel and that was the kind of word that he used. So it's not just that the logic of the market starts to penetrate social relations on its own, but there's a very deliberate effort on the part of the developer to exploit residents and influence social relations. Which in turn means that some community elites end up benefiting disproportionately from speculative opportunities that are opened up by suburban real estate development. But then they also shape aspirations for non elite in those communities as well. And finally, we can see clear evidence that these kinds of market based me mechanisms of acquisition have started to change the way that residents understand and view land. So here we have someone saying you know, that they had never imagined that land could be used for anything other than agriculture. But now, thanks to DHA, we know that it's useful for other purposes as well. And then someone else saying, you know, we, we only bought land that we needed before, but now we just want to buy more and more land. But then, you know, people like us from a particular caste you know, may not necessarily have the resources to do so. So it's shaping those aspirations. And then the last quote over here is just saying that, you know, people used to think that they couldn't use it for anything but with agriculture, but now we think there's no limit to the value that land can take. So in some ways, the state's active institutional support for suburban sprawl, along with the political failure of alternative imaginaries of agrarian use, has resulted in this growing social acceptance that land is the most, or most viable way to secure substantial financial returns. This has both shaped and reshaped urban life, as well as our relations to one another, creating new types of citizens and inequalities in the city. But we just wanted to show today that this, you know, this isn't natural, there's nothing organic about this process. And there are a number of factors and, and agents and power inequities that have made us think about land this way and have made this transformation possible. So I'm going to stop here and I'll let Hannah continue. All right. So um, our first research question uh, focused on looking at the impact on uh, social relations, the built form, the built environment, uh, demographics, and experience of space uh, when these villages and these peri urban spaces are surrounded by suburban residential projects. And we were particularly interested in uh, looking at how this change unravels over time. Um, and essentially, we were looking at three different timelines. Uh, one was uh, the acquisition patterns as they've evolved over time, and Fiza has already uh, spoken about it briefly. Um, the second was uh, the changes that unravel within these villages post-acquisition, 
Um, and uh, this happened usually at the scale of decades, um, which is why I wanted to look at different villages at different points in time. Um, even if some of them happen at a very quick rate in the earlier stages. And the third is change over time and across villages in the different methods of mobilization uh, to secure services or access to infrastructure and the different success rates that they enjoy. Before any major impact on the land use uh, within the village itself, uh, one of the first instances of change that can be documented occurs in the landscape around the village as the developer slowly starts to develop new infrastructure. It is at this point uh, that the old infrastructure can either become a site of friction or it can be used as a tool for negotiation between the developer and the, and the village itself. Um, and uh, it can be used as a tool for negotiation in multiple ways. It can be exchanged uh, in, in, uh, for services, access to infrastructure, access to amenities. Um, all of those things are kind of used to uh, negotiate for um, uh, um, in exchange for land. So de to demonstrate, uh, we have one example here, which is the case of Harpalke, which is now a village that is completely surrounded by DHA phase nine, but it was first impacted when Askari 11 uh, came about. So you can see here, this is Harpalke at the bottom over here, and this is Zorawala, um, another village at the top, and it's connected through this Sarkari road that can be seen over here. Uh, it is important to note that these villages in the outskirts of the city almost act like a constellation in which the connection between the two different villages um, in the form of these roads allows them to form a larger network uh, amongst themselves. So these Sarkari roads are almost considered untouchable and in many cases, in, in a way, they kind of are. So when Askri 11 was developed, uh, this road, um, you can see that it still cuts right through Askri 11. It's, it's almost untouched, uh, not almost entirely untouched. Um, and uh, in its earlier years, um, the access is retained. <coughs> Eventually, uh, some villagers claim that certain affluent sections of both villages somehow negotiated some favors for themselves and approved the takeover of this road by Askri 11. And it was shifted to the west of uh, Askri 11 uh, but which most importantly, we did not directly connect Harpalke to Rorawala, and that connection was broken. So you can now see that the uh, place where the road actually ran is now being filled in with buildings over here. So this caused a major rift between the community and the administration, as many in the village claimed that this was done without their consent and without due compensation in the form of an alternative right of way. This is just one example of uh, many more just for this village, uh, which have caused friction between the two parties and in at least one case, we know that the friction eventually led to unrest and eventually ended up uh, that a lot of villagers were arrested and are still kind of uh, facing the brunt of that. So, um, Harpalke um, being fairly new, uh, a fairly new victim to this kind of development, uh, there is much more awareness in terms of uh, what they can all rightfully claim as, as part of their village landscape, and they can negotiate uh, access to infrastructure and services better accordingly. Um, even if they're not properly organized. <clears throat> so as you can see over here, um, this is the main homestead of Harpalke, uh, but the landscape of the village actually extends far beyond the main homestead. So the Eidgah was over here, the main graveyard of the village is over here, there's a bar over here, there's numerous batiks uh, that can extend it all the way out till over here, um, in this right corner over here. Um, and this is not even an exhaustive mapping of this, of the landscape of the village. So. One of the ways in which the village is now using their old infrastructure to negotiate for better services in exchange for giving these up is in the case of khals or waterways around the village. So we spoke to a group that claims that the length of these khals adds up to a sizable amount of land and uh, they would be willing to give it up in, in exchange for a list of services and access to amenities that they've drafted. So this is how you know uh, infrastructure can also be used as a negotiating tool. There's also a lot of change that starts to unravel within these villages. Once the basic infrastructure has been laid out um, around the village, uh, in most cases a boundary wall is erected around the extent of the village and this one shows over here uh, the boundary walls around Harpalke actually by now even these walls are now being erected. So it's like completely uh, encircled and there are very specific entry points into the village. As the infrastructure of the new housing scheme develops, and sometimes way before that, um, and this starts to happen right after the acquisition of land around the village, we start to see land use change within the village too, particularly at the edges um, of the village homestead. The process of densification starts, uh, where landed families who have generated cash influx, like as I just mentioned, from selling agriculture land, look to upgrade their homes. As the extents of the village are now are marked, there's now only uh, existing open spaces within the village that they can infill. 
So you can see over here, this is the same uh, area as this um, about 10 years ago. 10 years later, you can see that the southern edge has become more packed, and um, um, the more affluent families, the landed families that sold a lot of agriculture land, were able to claim what was the chopper area and, and uh, have kind of upgraded their houses over here. So this is now this edge over here is now, now the more affluent uh, side of the village. So as gentrification intensifies, uh, there is incremental growth in the built fabric with structures eventually rising up as high as four to five stories and with many extending so as far as they're possible into the street uh, at the upper levels. And in this case, you can see that it's almost blocking the sunlight from coming in. Because of this ad hoc incremental densification, existing infrastructure starts to lag. Uh, whether it is in the form of electric grid or sewage network, in many cases, it does not keep up with the rate of densification and it slowly starts to create problems that get more exacerbated as time goes on. Coming back to Rapalke, coming back to the same area, um, this chopper, so the chopper is usually like a sewage outflow for the uh, um, village. It has slowly been eaten up by the houses that have been constructed on the southern edge. And it's slowly been, as you can see, that's slowly being pushed out towards this side and eventually ends up over here. And then eventually now, where it's stated that it kind of ends up in the DHA area. How this will connect to the overall sewage grid, eventually, if at all it does, you know, that remains one of the questions that, you know, uh, remain to be answered. Um, so there's a critical point by which the infrastructure needs to catch up to the development happening within the village, because once it passes a certain threshold, the problem can become so overwhelming that it would require immense political will and most importantly, mass mobilization to resolve this issue. In the case of Chernobyl, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, there is a general acknowledgement across the board that the sewage and water supply issue has reached a critical point, but the response needed now is almost prohibitively expensive and seemingly impossible to mobilize. So what happens is in most cases, we then see isolated quick fixes around these villages, and these are also usually imparted as, political, as favors for political clout. At the more granular level, densification and encirclement of the village bring about the emergence of newer typologies within the village, which uh, see the conversion of single family units into multi-use units. This is initially enabled by the cash influx coming in from the sale of agriculture land, where families upgrade their houses at first, and then it's followed by uh, creating more sustained uh, spaces to create, generate further income, which is usually in the form of extra rooms for the purposes of renting out. And sometimes it's also, actually a lot of times it's also spaces for businesses and storage. So altogether, this drastically changes the neighborhood experience. In addition, because these villages are urbanized in almost a haphazard way, they create zones of exception uh, where bylaws and standards don't necessarily exist or are implemented if they do. In a mapping workshop that was conducted last August, a few participants studied the ways in which this incremental addition happens uh, within structures over time. Over here, they studied a single residential family unit being converted from a traditional two-unit room unit, like the Sahara and the Baranga, um, into a school over time uh, with extra rental units added later on. So this is this, uh, you know, a uh, typical house in a, in a Punjab village. Uh, eventually ended up uh, kind of getting densified and incremental addition made it, made it look like this. So over time, the structure grew to accommodate in a small piece of land, a fully functional school from grade one to 10, a residence for the school owner, as well as extra rental units at the topmost level. While those who own their own houses upgrade to better quality living units, those that are constructed uh, purely as rental units are usually extremely bare, designed as basic living like quarters, and uh, almost always without any consideration for the lived experience. As can be seen here in the case of a complex built specifically for rental purposes in Chanjate next to Lake City. What's happening within these villages, one of the most noticeable aspects is the disparities between uh, what were landed families and those that were not become even more visible over time. Even in terms of how access to infrastructure and services is secured, there's a major difference that can be observed with the more affluent being able to secure these much better and more efficiently. So you see over here, the lowest income neighborhoods have very limited means, very limited reach, so they're not, in, I mean, this is the kind of situation uh, of the streets that we're looking at. Uh, whereas the middle class neighborhoods, they uh, start to realize that, you know, if they're going to do something, get something done, that needs to be uh, self-initiated. So mostly through self help they're able to slightly upgrade their uh, streets. Whereas for the elite neighborhoods, um, especially with elections just around the corner, we are now seeing a flurry of activity of these sewage upgradation projects that's popping up all across these villages. But in either scenario for both this uh, self-help situation or um, these uh, uh, projects that are being introduced, they're all piecemeal standalone interventions 
which you know eventually end up um, um, not solving the problem at the larger level. So with the impending changes anticipated, um, so just to talk about the change in demographics and social relations before I conclude. Um, so one thing that happens is with the impending changes anticipated by the families within these villages, some opt to sell their home houses and move out to further rural areas uh, to, keep, to keep continuing with agricultural activity. But at the same time, there's also an influx of migrants uh, from rural areas moving into these urban villages looking for work in the surrounding neighborhoods. In some cases, and, and uh, as uh, I showed you over here in this case of Jandarte, where there is not an organic flow yet, uh, it is sometimes enabled by the neighboring housing scheme that have a need for service labor. So over here, uh, the Lake City administration engaged with the landowner um, in Jandarte to construct a complex to specifically house service labor um, that could service uh, restaurants and grocery stores within Lake City. And that's how they were able to lure business owners into opening or setting up shop in Lake City. So the dynamic between the original village residents and those migrating in is not always great. Uh, we have already we, uh, we have spoken already about the quality of rental units, but the renters usually undergo more scrutiny within the community, with most issues related to security and uh, or loss of neighborhood quality being attributed to them. And finally, in terms of the relationship between uh, the neighboring housing scheme and the village, most of it in the initial period is with the administration and uh, is uh, most transaction in nature. Um, and it's mostly fictional, as, as we've discussed. But once the housing scheme around has, is uh, occupied, it's is uh, post-occupancy, um, between the residents, it exists mainly in the form of an employee-employer relationship. The residents of the village are not allowed in pretty much all cases to use any amenities within the housing scheme. So for example, um, children are not use, allowed to use parks in Beria Town or DHA um, if they belong to one of these villages. On the other hand, the residents of the housing scheme are free to enjoy like cheaper services within the village extent, so salons, tailors, even schools in some cases. Bahir Town has only specific set of schools allowed inside its uh, boundaries. So a lot of people send uh, children to schools in these villages. So there's, there's this uh, kind of a one-way relationship that exists um, at, at, at this uh, stage. So yeah, that's that's uh, I'll stop over here. So this is the map from 1955. Um, it, Basically, the areas in yellow show the urban extent of the city at that particular point in time. Uh, where, uh, if I could sort of show you, we're somewhere here right now. Uh, and this is one of our field sites, Jared, and the other one should be here somewhere. So this yeah. is Harpalke. So as you can see, there's a lot that didn't exist in between, and this is all that's happened over the last uh, 70 or, or so years. Um, but actually the story is about 175 years of urban rural transformation. Uh, so Lahore proper, the 1,774 square kilometers that make up the city, houses 363 uh, mazas. And many of them have, have been enveloped over time by suburban housing residential development. And so we see this, the emergence of this continuum between what we call a village that turns into an urban village and that eventually turns into a mohalla. Um, and there are a whole host of changes associated with it. Obviously, demographic, as Hala has already mentioned, population numbers go up, population densification happens, uh, the composition of the population changes, you have material changes in livelihoods, build structures, service provision, consumption patterns, you have social cultural changes on gender norms, kinship patterns, internal caste and class hierarchies. But uh, I want to focus specifically on political and institutional sort of transformation. The first is that the legal status of a village is rendered invisible. So you pick up any master plan document uh, from Lahore, uh, there is no mention of, an, of a village as far as the actual uh, planning document is concerned. They are earmarked as residential areas, um, but apart from that, there is no consideration. In Delhi, which is the closest proximate example that we have to Lahore, uh, urban villages are earmarked as a specific type of settlement. Another sort of case that I found really interesting was when the Mazas census data of 2020 was released. Uh, it lists 363 Mazas in Lahore, but provides no characteristics of any of those villages. Lahore is the only district <clears throat> in which no data is reported for any of the village settlements. Uh, every other uh, village settlement you have data on population, on rural characteristics and so on. So there is this invisibilization of villages once they become enveloped by, uh, by housing. 
But more generally, uh, I feel like the kind of service provision that takes place in these villages is an interesting lens to evaluate what we call urban citizenship uh, more generally. So here's a site that's very close to home. This is one of the villages that we uh, captured. Occasional solid waste management when things obviously reach a certain point. Uh, you know, the LWMC tends to move in um, uh, you know, on, on one complaint or the other. But what we see is the actual sort of the real problem is on underground services which are water and sanitation. Hala has already pointed out this major problem. Where does fecal matter or where does the poo actually go? Right? It has to go somewhere. And the built densification around these villages means that the historical pattern through which it would move through the chapar, that obviously doesn't really exist anymore, right? Um, and so, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Noshin, I think if she's here, uh, she's done amazing work on water quality uh, in uh, a number of these settlements. And, and what we see happening is almost universally, uh, water, clean water provision is a headline issue regardless of which village settlement you end up in anywhere in the hall, right? And that's because it's an underground service and it's not something that is sort of negotiated through politics. Uh, it's a problem that remains uh, unresolved to a large extent. Obviously, some of these uh, sort of images uh, reflect uh, the kind of densification that happens and the kind of problems that many of these uh, you know, villages actually face. Now, these are some examples of the kind of negotiation that happens. These are uh, two um, uh, sort of political, sort of these are plaques that were, you know, uh, showed a, a, a PCC project, a, a basic sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, drainage channel that was inaugurated similarly in Harpal cave just because the elections are around the corner we start to see this development and every sort of this development has to have credit claiming associated with it in some form or the other so there's a plaque that goes up uh, you know uh, banners that go even if it's like literally just a, a relining or a repaving uh, of, a, of a street of this particular nature uh, but this is probably my favorite example uh, of credit claiming that street light I don't know if you can actually read uh, but that streetlight has uh, has a name on it, which is uh, Faisal Hakim Bhatti's name, who was uh, who was the son of the former number or one of the former number of Charit, and was a PTI MPA candidate here uh, 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 in the last election. So for him, this was the, the sort of uh, you know uh, his contribution uh, to uh, service provision uh, in 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 uh, in the village of uh, of Charit, or what is now actually the Mohalla of Charit. But let's contrast that with streetlights in in Bhagatam, right? Uh, there's obviously no plaque on any of these streetlights. These streetlights are provided for by the developer. And I think the, the what I find quite interesting is the discourse around service provision uh, as it sort of evolved in private housing schemes or even in schemes like DHS, right? And what we see is actually this contrast between clients and customers. And this is what sort of, I guess, Lahore's development since the late 1990s has actually resulted in. It's this dual model of citizenship where one set of citizens are customers, which uh, exercise customer rights because they have fiscal relations and plans. Fiscal relations essentially means that people say we pay for a service. So we deserve to get nicer street lights, we deserve to get nicer roads, nicer sewer systems, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and because the, the government, and, and in some cases local uh, you know, service providers say, well, they pay property taxes mm -hmm. as the village does. But what it actually ends up masking is that this rhetoric of private customer rights actually also involves the hoarding of basic services such as water, sanitation, and road infrastructure. The water table is common, whether it's in the, uh, the, the location of the housing development or it's underneath the homestead of the village, right? But clearly one site is able to extract a lot more and pay a nominal amount for it while the other has to make do uh, with, uh, you know, again, these piecemeal negotiated access uh, to services. And this is well documented in the case of, uh, of a India as well. But I find it quite interesting that um, that there is no third model of citizenship where you get uh, access to services just by your, just by the existence of the fact that you're a resident of a particular city. You are either the resident of a private developer, uh, of a private development, uh, and you pay for those services, in which case you have customer rights, or you're a Elect or you're a vote, essentially, in which case you have to have a clientelistic relationship in order to negotiate uh, access to uh, services. So yeah, so that was just a, sort of one of the concluding thoughts that we've had um, on uh, on this. And I feel like uh, as the development proceeds and there's a new master plan, a draft of the new master plan that's sort of come into play, and we see that this particular model of citizenship, this dual model of citizenship between customer rights and, and, and clientelistic uh, sort of negotiation, I feel like it's become much more entrenched in the way that we imagine how the city is going to grow uh, in the uh, coming years as well. Um, 
The last point here is how do uh, some of the higher order institutional and political economy factors actually make this possible? Like what are some of the larger structural drivers? Um, and the structural drivers, I mean, for those of you who are familiar with the context of, our, 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 of Pakistan in general, would know that Pakistan has essentially been in what is economic stagnation for the better part of three to four decades, right? And that is, means that you have uh, a whole host of sort of um, uh, illicit and, and, and informal financial flows taking place into real estate and real estate is often so seen as the only valuable store of wealth and that obviously drives fraud. But alongside that is also what we now consider to be a pretty major rural livelihood crisis, right? The reason that development of this type of land actually takes place is because people no longer see a future in agriculture, uh, especially in very urban areas. People are more than happy to find a way in which they can sell off their land get some money uh, you know, in the short term and then see what happens when the money runs out, right? And I think uh, both of these structural determin determinants have, have created the particular type of urbanism that we see uh, in, in Pakistan today. Uh, similarly, there are also institutional and regu regulatory drivers, so tax laws are particularly permissive to vacant housing development. Uh, there's no tax on vacant land. Um, there are a whole host of zoning exceptions. My favorite uh, you know, sort of anecdote from that is that in 2014, the LDA passed an amendment uh, to the Lahore Master Plan in which they designated a previous agricultural area as, a, uh, as now a residential area. And the reason for that was because DHA had just decided to build a few phases on that particular, uh, you know, uh, in that particular part of the city. So zoning exceptions ensure that, that this cycle sort of continues. And then finally, in the absence of, of elected politics at the local level, we know that there is a systematic up upgradation of any sort in these particular settlements is simply a non-starter. Um, so yeah, so that is, I guess, pretty much it uh, for uh, for what we wanted to present. Uh, I wanted to thank, uh, obviously, our team, uh, Aiza, Ali, and Mohit, who uh, helped us, uh, you know, throughout these past um, uh, couple of years of doing field work, uh, and also, obviously, to all of the respondents in, in, our, in our settlements who, uh, you know, took out the time uh, to speak to us. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for these great presentations. Um, I will moderate the session. We have about 20 minutes for question and answer. Um, and maybe we can take them in three so that we will have a chance, we have a chance to get as many questions as possible. Um, and to start off, as is common, I will abuse my right as moderator to just ask a couple of questions to each side, but you don't have to maybe answer them right now and we can collect a lot of questions before we come back to it. Um, it was so nice to see the um, documentary and it just kind of brought home the way that sort of just the amount of perseverance through which we can build a home. And so I wanted to ask two quick questions. One that kind of focuses on something, Iromi, that you say in the documentary, that what we see is a militarized vision of space, um, of urban development. And I wondered if you could locate it, or locate what you mean by this militarized vision of development with the alternatives that are there for technocratic, you know, is there a difference between the technocratic vision for development, urban development, or popular vision? And to kind of put it in comparison with Pakistan and with Lahore, where you know the militarized vision of urban development obviously overlaps with the technocratic as well as popular, which is why middle class housing and the military are such good friends, right? Um, and so I wondered if you could talk a little about it. Um, and my other question is a little bit of cheating because I asked Asha this question before when I saw this film, and now I can ask you guys: Is that had this been focused? on men, and you would ask, interviewed men, would there be a different vision of loss and sociality that would be coming out, and whether it would be so much centered on the home, or on the public places or social spaces around the Vati that were there, and how that would fit in with the wider gender politics and gender economy of Sri Lanka. And for Rafiza, Omer, Hana, and the rest of the Lahore team, um, really, really uh, fascinating work, particularly I think that because it destroys that very simplistic picture of lands acquired from poor people through either state or elite groups. Um, whereas I think the way that you bring in the intricacies of all the intermediaries that are involved and the people that benefit. And I really want to hone in on that a little bit to ask you about this wider economy, right, and the different class backgrounds that are involved and the way that they might benefit in a very extractive way from it. 
And it goes back to something that Omer also said in his conclusion about the structure, the determinism that's there, about people don't see a future in agriculture, right? So in some ways, given that there's this wider economy that's facilitated, which is very extractive, and if you think about it in relation to lack of alternative, are we seeing this as this kind of extractive method of social mobility that is available through the market and the absence of other things? And I think about it very much in relation to my own field work with middle class groups, right? That everyone has some kind of hand in speculative urban development somewhere, right? Or if they don't have a hand, then the aspiration is that maybe somehow I can get a file, which later could facilitate my daughter's wedding or my son's school or so on and so forth. And so are we thinking about this also in relation to sort of any absence of other real methods of social mobility and thinking about the, the class groups that are involved within this entire uh, model of urbanism? Um, so I will leave it there. Thanks, Amara. And again, the Tour Eco Ride, it's very nice to be here in person. Um, and so, what I mean about miniaturized development is that uh, previously, our urban development, the Urban Development Authority, was under the central government. But after the war ended in 2009, it was brought under the Ministry of Defense. So, I mean, there's a lot of sort of things at play here, but very specifically to urban development, it it was also one way, it, it, was, it was doing a couple of things. One was that the war had ended so brutally and it was also a very easy and a fast way to change that image of the brutalizer to that of the beautifier because they were engaged in gentrifying the city or gentrifying spaces, uh, cleaning up the city, you know, making up for that development that was lost that we talked about. But it was also part of a larger sort of a ideology around discipline and of efficiency. And the person behind this whole thing was Gota Rajapaksu, who was the defense secretary when the war ended, who was the brother of the president, who then went on to become president himself. So it was also building his own political career, but he entered it as a non-politician. He was the efficient person because that's how you get things done. So it paved the way for this kind of rapid development to happen in a way that we had never seen before in Colombo because there was complete disregard for due process because there was military backing behind it. So you could go, you could gentrify spaces without, and people were also more scared than they were before of the Urban Development Authority. So it gave them a lot more power um, to do this kind of spatial uh, modifications and gentrifications in a way that we had not seen before. And that militarization was very much, like I said, about disciplining spaces and clearing informal spaces. So it was about, it was also about class. It was about, so much of it was about, we have to tell them how to live. And, you know, very quotable quotes about, you know, with that discipline we'll also come to them by moving them. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at Lahore, and over here, I think some of the parallels that we see is that it is sort of, it, it's militarized, but there's also so much class involvement. It's, it's also about, very much about aesthetics mm -hmm. and whose aesthetics are taking over, whose aesthetics are shaping our cities. Because by disciplining these spaces, by using the power of the military and the power that they hold over the whole process, you are also able to shape what the city looks like and how it expands and how it develops. And then what is also being erased is the, the aesthetic of the working class. You are telling them, this is not how your houses should look like, this is not the color of your houses, this is not how you should live, this is not where you should be wending. It's, push, it, it's imposing this upper class, powerful, idea of what gentrified spaces look like, what a world class city looks like, because in the Dubai's and the Hong Kong's and the Shanghai's and the Singapore's, you don't see this kinds of housing, you don't see this kind of vending, you don't see the messiness, right? And that is the and in that sense like what that's what's so similar about our two sites and about those two cities and even the other cities in South Asia that we work in, is that this imposition of an aesthetic mm -hmm. and the disciplining of a space. Um, and for the and since we've been working with you also since 2017, those are the kind of themes that for me have been quite interesting to see from our two cities. Two different machineries for sure, 
and two types of governance, all of that is there, like differences are there. But I think broadly that kind of thinking for me is quite st striking. And maybe I'll just uh, hand over to Rai for the second question. Okay, of course. Um, okay, so the question on, uh, on the kind of looking at this through a gender lens and what if we were focusing on men rather than women. Um, I think it's a little difficult to kind of even imagine that to be the case because we went into the study very specifically saying we are going to study women. Um, but that isn't to say that we didn't want to take into account the experiences of men, but we had already made that decision. But in order to answer your question, Amaya, I realized that I had to kind of look at something else that was another study done um, through a different university in different, uh, a completely different way of looking, but at the same kind of geographical space, which is um, Central Colombo, something that Iromi had asked us to do. And so we, um, we looked at people's experiences of understanding the city they live in, their memories and history, and we looked at men and women separately because we had a list, we had kind of listed out as women, men, and people from different um, ethnic backgrounds. So we had Muslim women, Muslim men, Tamil women, Tamil men, uh, Sinhala women, Sinhala men, and also trying to cover the religious aspects because I think the, the, the place in which we had um, done our documentary also has all of these different kind of religious um, communities, different ethnic backgrounds. And so the experiences, in, I mean, in order to, like I said, in order to answer that question, I have to reflect on both of those because it was really interesting. The men were able to talk about public spaces, talk about football, talk about how they used to play cricket and the ground is no longer there, talk about how they used to go swim in the Bay in a lake, which is a, a lake that, you know, it, it's very murky and muddy, but that's a different story. But talk about the experiences and their engagement in those kind of public spaces. And the women rarely spoke about any of that. They spoke of their home, their neighbors, and their immediate, like we said, their road. Um, and their experiences of home were very different, just incredibly rich, and their memories of food or memories of like, yeah, I mean, those were the things that were just really uh, the things that resonated with them and the experiences of violence, experience, all of those things as opposed to the larger kind of, you know, access to public spaces and the kind of, almost like a macro micro story. Um, so um, I, I think it would have been very different had we uh, shared these stories of home uh, and through through uh, kind of a male lens, but already I feel, especially when we talk of Colombo, the narrative that we hear now, even in kind of media and the public space, is often narrated through a very male lens. And so it was important for us in that sense, not just through the study, but through the film also, to bring out uh, a more feminist lens and a feminist perspective. I hope that answers the question. I'll just be very quick and I wanted to um, answer with an example. So we've talked a lot about villages that have not been acquired. So the home where the homestead hasn't been acquired. But there's a village settlement in phase seven. Um, that <laughs> that yeah. Yeah. I was like, maybe I won't name it, but <laughs> um, no longer a secret. Um, so this village, the homestead has been acquired by the DHA. All, it's, I think it's almost done now. And the DHA hired someone from within the village to empty out the land and encourage people to sell their, their houses. And that family, you know, they, they said they've achieved a kind of social mobility that they had never even dreamt of because they were able to take that land, give it to the DHA in exchange for files, and then sell those files in the market and then make a lot of money in the process. So we found a lot about this, right? That there are people who are able to achieve social mobility in, in ways that, they, that were never open to them before. Mm. They've also, with what, the thing that's interesting about this case is they've also built a new small housing scheme on Bikley Road for residents of the village. It's called New Zira Village. Um, but, you know, people, and, and people have like their cars, they have proper houses over there. But the thing is that it's only people with land who are able to benefit to that extent, right? Um, and so, so, so not everyone benefits in the same ways and those opportunities are only available to them in very limited ways. Um, but one thing that we've seen in speaking to all of them, like people who've been acquiring land for different developers, is that they're all they're also very upset about how agricultural land is being lost, even though they're the ones handing it over to the developers. So there's, there's a larger structural sort of element at play over here as well. 
And one other interesting thing that we found in this, with this example was that the Christian population has always been living there. They didn't want to go to the new housing development. They said, I'm in Georgia, I'm going to go to the new housing Right, so it's a different kind of mobility. Um, so yeah, I guess, I mean, there are different factors that we have to look at. But Umair, do you want to add? I think, I mean, I, I guess it was naive of us in the first place to think of this, but, you know, we go in thinking, you know, there's this sort of massive transformation happening and resistance, you know, we, we go in finding, you know, in the hope to find some form of, like, resistance, there's no resistance. Like, people are, landowners want this to happen, like, they, it's hegemonic, the ideal of, there of, but there's resistance in the sense that there is some partial romanticization of, of this nostalgia of what life used to be. But the minute someone shows up with a fire, right? It is that yes, this is this is what we want, and everyone and, and you know the I was looking at uh, labor force survey data for Lahore. You know the third or fourth most common occupation in the city is property dealing. Yes. Like it's I I mean I'm, I'm not making this up. Like it's shopkeeper, construction worker, teacher, and I think then property dealer. So the four pillars of our society, I guess, are like the four <laughs> pillar is is property dealer and and. Uh, I mean, and, and anyone who's documented sort of suburban housing development in, in this city or anywhere else in the lab would know that it's usually the village itself that first becomes a site for these offices to open up with like sort of land brokers and land providers and so on. So the ideal of, of suburban development, or at least of not even suburban development, forget what the aesthetics of it all are, the ideal of commodifying land from and turning it from agriculture into a file is hegemonic. And I think that is, uh, that explains why the city has, that actually also helps explain why people would argue that this is not right, you know, that we're wasting so much land and yet we're, we're helpless in front of it. We just have to participate in it. So it's the most concrete example of a structural determinant that I can see in terms of how people, of how all of this actually plays out. Um, okay. We have people like Aisha and the audience, I'm curious to hear more. Uh, I can speak well. So this question of the is a really interesting because my research is also in the war and looking at land acquisition housing scheme development and actually my side I've seen a great deal of resistance. So first of all I wonder what's what's happening because based on the documentary, wonderful documentary that we watch, there seems to be a general unwillingness to move for a whole host of social, cultural, economic reasons. And in my field side, I saw similar kind of social cultural dynamics at work, which was the key in my class that was me and you know, at least, you know, we have, I have four sons, but if we get compensation or a file or two, then maybe we'll get like a small area of land in another part of urban law, but then where does that dream go, right? So, and I remember because I know there's, you know, it's become popular today to say that people want to engage in this market process of social mobility through real estate development. So I asked again and again, are you sure you don't want to? Are you really resistant? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we don't. And yes, late city South London, so we do, why are they getting more than we're getting? That was a consideration. But you know, they were in the courts of resisting this stuff as well. So uh, I wonder what, whether we can talk about why maybe your field sites are seeing one dynamic my fields that we're seeing was why in Colombo we're seeing a general unwillingness to move and why in Lower we're not seeing that. Interesting, I think, compared to this kind of analysis I could have. And secondly, just a more empirical question, which is what is an urban village? How is that defined in India, for no, instance? No. And we'll see if we associated right, are there associated rights and entitlements that come from that designation? Uh, in the Indian context, that could actually benefit um, uh, the residents in the field sites you've worked at. Because I wonder what the point is of categorizing it as an urban village and whether it's even beneficial to look at it that way or whether we want to look at them as run of the mill urban citizens or whether we want to keep them in this in between space. You know, so I wonder what kind of possibilities are presented through this kind of categorization. Before you guys answer this, um, could I ask if someone else has a question? Maybe we can connect three in a in a room. In these two presentations, so um, thinking about Colombo, it seems like there's a imagination of a city there, but I didn't get that so much when I was, you know, so you're talking about urban settlements, villages that are invisibilized, and but the reigning sort of imaginary seems to be property. It's like the idea that comes through is that the idea of property and how everyone is interacting 
with the idea of property. I'm wondering also this. Um, also, would like to know more about how people reflect on property. Do they think, you know, you think property dealer, one of the most popular professions, but what is everyone thinking about property? And I see in these pictures as well that Colombo comes through as something, you know, people are interacting with. In these images of the wall, what I see are drains, walls, etc., etc., and you know, sort of built infrastructure much more. So I'm just, I don't, is, is it, so is that something we can think about? But the other thing is, um, these villages are also great sites for, um, they attract um, people who migrate from, from you know, villages, and a lot of them end up as in, informal laborers for the suburban homes. And I, I, do, I wonder if, if that uh, sort of interacts with what's going on there, spatially, culturally, etc. Um, so with, with regard to Colombo, we, maybe that's something that we didn't make very clear um, in the film is that if you look at the low-income communities, it is very unlike any other global South community, is that we had decades of state intervention in the housing for, urban, for the urban poor and also state provisioning. So people are voting, they're paying taxes, they're paying their utility bills. And that recognition by the state in, in terms of provisioning, even in the absence of, say, deeds, has given people that sense of security, which means that they have put in their own money, incrementally built their houses, and they are also not just building their houses, they are building up as their families are growing. And so if you look at the latest data, the, the last census that was conducted a few months ago by a couple of our organizations in every single low-income settlement in Colombo, it shows that over 90% of Colombo settlements fall into the category of permanently upgraded. So they are not slums, they are not shanties, and they are not sprawling. It's only about 4% of the, the, the settlements that have more than 200 houses. So our context in that sense is very, very different. So even in terms of comparisons, you have to keep all of that in mind. And the communities themselves, like they say, uh, I don't know how, how evident it was, but they kept saying, make Gama village. It is their village. Colombo is their village. If you ask them to go home during the new year, there's nowhere to go. It is their village. It is where they live for generations. So, so they talk about it in that way because the city has a very different place for them in a very different way that we see in other global south cities, right? And I think finally, uh, the other difference we see in these sites and with Colombo is that here, Lahore, the city is moving to the rural, right? They're acquiring land, they're moving to the rural and then it's becoming a city. In Colombo, everyone is living in the center of the city. It's also a very small city. So for them, they're not actively taking part in this kind of development because A, their houses are permanent, their neighborhoods are very nice, and they have nothing to benefit from giving up their land to the state or the developers and going somewhere because none of the things that they're talking about in terms of location, livelihood, can be afforded in the suburbs. So our sites are very different in that sense, which is also what makes this kind of work so interesting for us about what can we learn from the specificities of the two sites. I know something very small, but also in Kalambo and in the sites that we've been working in, there's also contradiction. So in some areas there are communities who are resisting, but at the same time, the third story you saw of the woman, Gen Z, she lived in a, a fishing community that was just outside the city of Kalambo, and so she moved into the high rises <coughs> while we were doing this film, and now, she's actually moved back. Not to the same place, because that place has been completely you know, bulldozed over, but she's on rent in a place that's close to her children's homes. But it talks of the contradictions of that aspiration to move into this city, to, to move into a high rise where there's more access to you know, things, and that's what they wanted, the community wanted, and they got there, and then they were like, hmm, well, this is not what we will, you know? And so you go back. And so there are those contradictions. I just wanted to point that out, that even in Colombo, there is resistance, but there's also the flip side of it. So there's this contradiction that each community kind of deals with. Very quickly, I just wanted to respond to your question. I think there's really, I mean, we, we've simplified it some, but there's yeah. really a continuum in terms of resistance. Like, it's not that everyone is outright there resisting in these settlements, and it's not that everyone is like, oh yes, please, please, you know, developers come in and we want it. 
there are groups across that continuum. Um, and I think we were expecting that there would be a lot more resistance than we saw, but, there, but, but that continuum exists, and it also differs by developer. So interestingly for us, and we're still trying to figure out why, but in Beria town, there was less resistance. Um, a lot of people are very happy with the compensation we got, with the money that we got. There was going towards over the scene. That was not what we were expecting to hear. Um, so, so I just wanted to kind of point that out. And the other thing was just about the homestead. In most cases, no one wants to leave their houses, right? The, the settlement that is there, there is absolutely no way that if anyone wants people. And we heard that one or two people say, "Gosh, no, you I mean, that's an exception. Uh, but in most cases, like people will fight a lot more for their right to stay on that land. But the, in terms of agricultural land being acquired, there is that continuum. And um, I guess I'll let you guys talk about the urban village definition. Yeah. But it is a, a fear that we have also about like what if these get recognized, and then what if that results in more problems? You know. I just want to add on to what uh, Fida talked about. Uh, and the reason I pulled up this slide was uh, just to show you this bar over here. Um, and this bar is one uh, example where um, this, this person who owns this land did not want to sell the land and literally overnight he, he assumed that DHA would kind of just take over the land. So he overnight planted like a whole kind of a, a dense tree network in that uh, area now called it a bar. And so you walk right through the landscape over here and you'll see this, this uh, plot of land which is, you know, uh, sitting there in the middle of uh, this DHA infrastructure. So there's resistance. I think the resistance is now converting in the fact, like as I said, people know that um, their, their homestead is safe and I think that's something that they're pretty kind of uh, sure about. But in terms of agriculture land, I think now it's more about negotiating better for themselves than outrightly <coughs> saying not interested. Because I think, you know, just that the entire market, market logic is coming in. If you're going to get what three generations would make all together within, with the sale of one plot of land, I think it just makes more sense for them to sell it, as long as they're able to negotiate it on their terms. And I think that's what people are now starting to realize, that rather than say, outrightly saying no, we, we have the power to kind of negotiate um, and I talk about it. And then obviously there's other sides of friction. So I talked about uh, how rights of way, um, when they're taken away, there is, there is resistance, there is uh, kind of that uh, you know, standing up for it. But again, um, as long as they're kind of able to negotiate uh, better services, better infrastructure in exchange for that. And I think also what Umer said about, um, you know, property dealer being the fourth most kind of a, a common, common occupation in Lahore. In Lahore. In Lahore. In Lahore. Uh, I think that also speaks into how the acquisition patterns have started to change. Um, because like as I mentioned that initially it was just like, you know, outright purchase of land, you got cash removal. But now, um, especially in DHA, you're actively seeing uh, DJ kind of encouraging you to become land providers. So there's this this uh, kind of space that they've allowed to um, for people to kind of say, okay, agricultural activity that's out the window. Let's now kind of look into this as as a profession. I think that's also kind of um, the fact that it's the fourth most common occupation. I think that's uh, indicative of what's what's actually happening. But I think because I studied the lower development authority, yeah. I think it has a lot more to say about the way people look at private developers versus yeah. 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 trust. The the yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And it actually turns out that their compensation rates are much lower. Than yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And because they rely on a legal instrument, or at least on occasion, well, they, 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 they also they, use the same. They use the same. Yeah. Yeah. So on the question of urban village uh, and why, so in India it's a designated category under the so the first Delhi master plan in the 1960s. The, the first time it was mentioned uh, was in the 1960s. With Delhi Lahore are very similar in terms of their urban output. Uh, flat, uh, arable land on, on all sides, no, no natural constraint to the expansion of the city. And so uh, the Delhi Development Authority ended up acquiring a lot of land uh, which was historically, uh, you know, mostly agricultural land around the outskirts of what was at that time uh, the Delhi Municipal Corporation. And so in the master plan they designated these settlements and because they're protected under the same land revenue regime that you have on this side of the border as well, which is you have the Lalaki around the homestead, which gives you a uh, right to uh, homestead land. So the homestead land, you have a title deed to the actual land that you have. So that makes it cumbersome for people to go in and buy all of it. But it also offers you legal protection against overnight uh, acquisition. So the Delhi Development Authority designated these places as urban villages, and they had this entire sort of very sort of I guess in some ways optimistic view that these uh, urban villages would become sites for 
uh, your local entrepreneurship, handicrafts, you know, some like a escape from urban, uh, you know, the urban life form to to something that's more traditional. Obviously, that's not what happened. It ended up becoming mostly, as as, as Halad mentioned, property for rent uh, for incoming urban migrants. So I think the distinction that we draw is that we we know there's a legal status for a village, uh, which is the revenue estate which exists and it has you know certain types of legal provisions and protections involved. We also know that homestead is legally protected, which makes it different from an informal settlement, um, and because you have right to land and, and, and title. Um, eventually, uh, an urban village becomes a mahalla. I mean, that's the nomenclature that's used. Again, it doesn't reflect itself in the in the actual master planning document. But one of the things that we found was that because of the pattern of densification that happens in these spaces, and because of the original layout, they are distinctive from smaller lower income. Uh, housing colonies that we see emerging in other parts of the city. Um, and I think that requires the government to intervene with a completely different set of, uh, of at least resources as far as underground uh, services are concerned. So what happens to a sanitation network which had a particular pattern of, of, uh, of disposal for you know 70 years and now suddenly that is no longer a possibility. So we feel Again, we're not proposing that the urban village should be adopted as a category, but truly the infrastructure and legal uh, status that these, uh, these segments have make it distinctive from just evaluating them as uh, informal segments or uh, you know housing developments or uh, any of those other categories that we currently have. I think given that we are running over time, I'm just going to close the question and answer session. But if people have more questions, please reach out to both teams afterwards. And I'll now hand over to Jonathan for his closing remarks. They need to happen this time. Maybe five minutes. <laughs> Bless them. Okay, so I have, I have three words written down in front of me. I could just do the three words, and then, which are thanks, comparison, which I think meant, was meant to be conversa conversation and relationships. Uh, no, what is that relation? I can't even read what I've written down in front of you. I think I'll start first of all just by echoing the thanks to our hosts here at NAMS, other institutional hosts in, in Lahore, ideas, uh, to Fiza, Uma, uh, Hala, and uh, Mohid Ali, and Isa, who, who've been part of all this bigger project. The, the, the project, this project that we're coming towards the end of now is, is the second of two, and the first of them uh, started with a casual conversation between myself and my companion on my left, uh, who was mm, staring down the end of a contract at the time uh, in Edinburgh. About, was it seven years ago? 2016, 2017? Yeah. yeah. And there was some little funding opportunity. They wanted stuff on infrastructure, Global South. Uh, and I've been talking to um, Mara about some work that my friend Asher had been doing with women who had been relocated in Colombo and a little light bulb lit above her head uh, and said, well, what about you know, the stuff happening in Lahore as well? We can maybe put something together for that. That was a relatively small project involving uh, Irumi and Asher at the Colombo end and uh, Isa and Mara here. Uh, and brought in Halla towards the end as well. That then expanded uh, towards the end of that. One of the things that happened uh, in this work was everybody really liked each other. Um, the relationships between the two, <coughs> the two cities, as well as relationships within the teams, were extraordinarily harmonious and productive and interesting and, dare I say it, fun. Um, so quite apart from anything else that we were learning by bringing the two cities together, we were learning something about working across national boundaries, um, working across disciplinary boundaries, um, working across uh, probably all sorts of other boundaries as well. And so towards the end, when the money started to run out, well, really, there was never very much in the first place, but when it, we did start running out in 2019, we put together another project. And for me, I have to say, I'm, you know, I'm an anthropologist, I'm a political anthropologist, uh, I'm not, uh, have any great claim to be an urban studies specialist, uh, or, or even a property developer, although you could probably be a property in the first place. We have a much, much posher event. Anyway, um, but for me, 
one, the reason why I, I committed to a second, much bigger, more ambitious project was simply that something precious had happened and it was important to find a way to keep those relationships going into the second phase. And so we brought in a somewhat unruly but rather wonderful group of um, architects and activists and dancers and singers and anthropologists from Mumbai. Uh, geopolitics mean that they're not here today and it means that when we go to Mumbai next week, unfortunately, our colleagues can't get there, but we all met in Edinburgh and we all met in Colombo. And I think we could say we had quite a nice time um, doing that. Moving from that to um, the substance of what we've been talking about today, uh, I mean, the, for me, what has been most important about this week is not comparison in some sort of you know, like typological grid, tick here for Colombo, cross there for Lahore, or even comparison in terms of some kind of synthetic statement, of, which is true for all of these different places. The, the collaboration for me has been above all about conversation and, and about counterpoint. It's been about the differences as much as the similarities. The fact that if you come from Colombo, where there's been loose talk about militarized development since the end of the war, when you come to Lahore, you realize there's like a rather different story here, and that the word militarized doesn't actually begin to tell you very much about what has taken place within that story. So in that respect, what it's, it's done has been to um, destabilize uh, the confidence with which we build our descriptions in any particular local setting, and, and to raise new questions. One of those uh, helpful things that it does as well um, is it destabilizes the sense of inevitability that has so much been part of the recent history of urban, urban development in all three of our sites. That there is no alternative to what's going on, that the iron logic of the market or the iron logic of militarized development or whatever iron logic you do cannot be turned or deviated from in any other way. But in each case, you see other things are happening in each of these places which suggest that, that what happens before us is not inevitable. In terms of the actual substance, um, when we met in Colombo just before Christmas, or in fact, it might have been in this strange jungly place, uh, I discovered that people from Lahore don't really take to the jungle. Uh, I can see what we're doing to agriculture. I can see. Yeah. We don't like snakes. But we were kind of brainstorming around the concept of the, the world class city uh, in general. and. Um, one, one question that came up was, okay, so when people talk about the world-class city, what are, what are the exemplars? What are the ones they talk about immediately? Shanghai, Singapore, Dubai. <coughs> and what do they have in common? Well, one thing they have in common, which is not so much the glitchy skyscrapers and the hype and so forth, is, well, authoritarianism, very, very authoritarian rule in each three, of the three places. But the other one is a systematic denial of citizenship to the urban working class. Uh, each of it worked out in different ways in, in Shanghai from the ways in which rural workers are deprived of access to education and health and other services for their families. In Dubai, we know about the regimes of labor migration in Dubai and, and elsewhere in the Gulf. Uh, and in Singapore, again, denial of basic citizenship rights to labor migration. So you think, well, okay, so this big project that we've all been talking about, one of the things it's about is, and this is beautifully anticipated actually in, in the presentation just now, it's, it, it's partly it's about an aspiration to disenfranchise the, the, the working people of the city, to create a city where the working people have no political voice and, and no political leverage at all. But you can still see, even if it's at these, these pulsing moments of elections here, uh, or in the many different ways in which it's manifesting in Colombo, you can see that this is not actually necessarily what's happened. So in that, for me, there's a, there's a lot of things to think about and a, a, a lot more that could be said. But there's also, I think, a message of, of, of hope, of potential, that these things can actually turn out other ways. There are other ways of imagining the city, as well as other ways for, for me. And this is like my swan song. This is... Yeah, this has been going on for so long I stopped working for the university and I'm still here, I'm like that cartoon character that runs over the cliff edge and is still running, hasn't noticed that they're meant to have fallen down. Um, for me, this has also been a model of what, you know, academic inquiry and intellectual life really ought to be about, these kind of these horizontal uh, relationships amongst people. 
groups of interested researchers, as I said before, crossing boundaries and, and talking together. There's some absurd note at the end of the film talking about this project was led by Professor Jonathan. So it's like, led? I don't remember leading anything. I remember <laughs> signing stuff. I remember dealing with all sorts of bureaucratic nightmares, but I don't think any of these people needed leading anywhere. What I remember being able to do is maybe opening one or two doors, ushering people into the scene. I think you might profit from talking to that person and so on. That seems to me to be the model of, of the best things of what academic life has done. This whole project for me has been a really great thing. It's a nice one to go out on. So thank you all very much.